Well, hello, ladies and gentlemen, and it's Ken, aka That One Noob, here today with yet another new and exciting video review. Today, we'll be taking a closer look at the IER M7, the IER M9, and of course, the Sony IER Z1R, three earphones that were just released at the Hong Kong High End Audiovisual Show that Joseph was also just at. Now, Joseph has left us with a lot of information, so this is going to be a bit of a long video. So tight as I take you through all of Sony's lineup, or look below in the description for timestamps to jump to the part that you're perhaps most interested in. You can always follow the discussion on the head five thread that I will be linking in the description below, or perhaps uh, join us on our Discord channel where we have live conversation over text and voice. Um, that is also going to have an invite link in the description below. Now, without further ado, let's get started. So let's kind of get situated here really quickly. The IR M7 is a 4BA driver earphone. The IR M9 is a 5BA driver uh, earphone. And the Z1R is a hybrid earphone featuring three drivers, a five millimeter dynamic tweeter, a 12 millimeter full range, and a balanced armature. And it's not entirely clear what the balanced armature does in that whole uh, scheme of things, but alas, it's in there. Um, I think the first thing that a lot of people are going to notice is the fact that the designation of the earphones is IER, which has never been used before. Previously, I think the earphones were called XBA, or you know, if you go back a little bit further, it's the EX1000. And for those of you who've been in the market long enough, the IER is going to stand for in your reference, as you probably guessed. The I'm going to leave a slide below that kind of demonstrates the shift while I talk my way through the rest of this segment, and the. I think immediately you'll notice that the M7 and the M9 uh, kind of fall under that family of the uh, reference monitors that Sony is trying to create. Um, I'm personally not certain that we need to make this massive distinction between uh, what we consider audiophile listening versus studio reference listening, but I do get that audiophiles per per perhaps prefer a little bit more coloration and Sony's trying to cater to that. Um, so that's kind of a general shift. I don't think um, well, I don't know, I guess, uh, if this uh, shift towards reference tuning will be extended to all of Sony's monitors, including perhaps their uh, lower end IEMs, but it is certainly interesting and refreshing, and I think it's going to make uh, the new Sony IEMs a lot more compelling to uh, IEM users who've been looking for a more uh, neutral sound signature. Now, moving on to the shared technology that kind of ties all of this these earphones together. Um, as some of you may know, a lot of earphones on the market today uh, feature Sonion or Knowles drivers. And effectively, um, you know, a lot of companies, they claim to have uh, custom drivers. And uh, this is simply them working with one of these two companies to adjust uh, some things on the drivers to make it satisf satisfactory for the product that they're trying to release. Very few companies have in fact uh, taken the, undertaken the huge task of producing their own balanced armature unit. And Sony, uh, given their massive manufacturing capability, um, obviously has the ability to do this. And you guessed it, uh, they are once again bringing back their own balanced armature driver. I think that it has been upgraded a little bit, so it's not entirely the same one that you're seeing on the Z5, but don't quote me on that. Um, the main thing about Sony's balanced armature drivers that they're trying to press is that uh, it does bring in two innovations that Sony is trying to uh, get the audio community to know about. And uh, the first one is called Direct Drive, and it's not entirely clear from the press packet what the Direct Drive is. So I'm going to leave a diagram of a traditional balanced armature uh, below, and you'll see that there's a connected to the armature is a drive pin, and the drive pin effectively more or less actuates the diaphragm. Uh, Sony claims, at least from the press packet, to have uh, directly connected the armature to the diaphragm. Um, I'm not certain whether this means that they've gotten rid of the uh, drive pin completely. Uh, I don't know how they're connecting the diaphragm to the motor system, but alas, they, they claim that whatever design they've implemented is definitely more efficient. So that's one aspect to be looking out for. The other, uh, which was explained in the press interview that I will eventually be uploading, um, I'm thinking that's going to happen later tonight, but uh, we'll see, um, is called the T-shaped driver. And the T-shaped driver is a little bit unique in the sense that uh, the armature itself is T-shaped. So let's start off by discussing what Sony's proposing with this T-shaped driver. Now, uh, Chief Architect 
chief sound architect Koji Nagano, which I'm sure some of you may know from the previous videos, especially the Z1R, uh, has stated that in Sony's uh, engineering experience, uh, they've been they've experienced uh, some sort of distortion uh, seen in standard balanced armature drivers that was apparently caused by an unbalanced motion in the U-shaped driver. Now, it is commonly known that balanced armatures have higher levels of third harmonic distortion, but what Sony do is doing is correlating this with the fact that they believe that the upwards motion and the downwards motion of the diaphragm when connected to a drive pin is uh, unbalanced. And this is, the, this is the reason for there being distortion. So they decided instead to employ what they call the T-shaped armature, and I'm gonna leave the diagram uh, below. It's been, probably been running for a little bit. And um, they've supposedly gotten lower levels of distortion on the balanced armatures with the symmetry uh, achieved with the T-shaped driver. It's certainly an interesting engineering claim, and I think some of this waits to be seen in the measurements below. But um, definitely it's innovative, and it's something that Sony's been able to achieve uh, by having their own manufacturing capability. Now, as mentioned, the direct driver is a little bit more confounding, but we're definitely going to get to the bottom of that eventually. Uh, Singapore will probably have a local Sony event, and the chief engineers uh, will probably be there as well, so we'll discuss further. Now, the other interesting to note, thing to note about the driver is that Sony is using open balance armature drivers without having a, a port for acoustic tubing. So this isn't exactly news, because we've seen this a lot recently. Um, We'll start by discussing the TIA drivers from 64 Audio, and of course, uh, the remarkably well-known Andromeda uh, also uses open balanced armature drivers. It's not in use, but it's always worth noting. Um, the, the one thing to note is that the, uh, the openness, I guess, of Sony's balanced armatures is, is still quite small compared to the TIA drivers from 64 Audio, and I think a simple comparison that you can see below kind of reveals that. All right, now that we're done discussing the specifics of the driver technology that Sony has employed in their new year phones, uh, we can jump into the specifics. I'm gonna start with the N7, M7 and M9. Now the M7, once again, is a four balance armature driver IEM. The M9 is a five balance armature driver. Both of these year phones uh, feature the drivers um, housed in some sort of a magnesium enclosure. And Sony's kind of uh, just proposing that, you know, the, the sound will mix in the housing and then it will travel through a short sound path, um, which they believe will help to lower resonance. Um, of course, we can also uh, discuss the crossovers, but it's much easier for me to show the diagram. So here's the M7 crossover, which you can see here. And here's the M9 crossover. Sorry for the photo quality, this was taken uh, at the press conference and obviously uh, we don't have the access to the corporate slides that Sony does have. Now the one thing that the M9 will have over the M7 is that it will feature a special super tweeter with a magnesium alloy diaphragm. And the magnesium diaphragm was chosen for its high rigidity and what the engineers call high internal loss. Um, interesting to see in this earphone because um, you know, recently a, a lot of uh, headphones from, especially from the Japanese market, such as the Z1R headphone uh, and the ADX5K from Audio-Technica have been playing around with this idea of having a, a magnesium or magnesium coated diaphragm. The Z1R obviously has that magnesium dome and the ADX5K is a magnesium coated driver. So um, I think the ADX5K, I haven't heard it myself. There seems to be quite a bit of buzz around it. It seems positive for the large part. So it's it's interesting to see this get transferred to a earphone. And I do look forward to seeing how it performs in the implementations of the MZ, uh, M7, M9, and also the Z1R, because the Z1R does use a single balanced armature driver. And it is also uh, featuring the, magne the magnesium diaphragm. Now, personally, uh, I am looking forward to the uh, M9 a lot. The design seems very sensible. It's, uh, it's a lot better thought out than the previous uh, uh, earphones from Sony, in my opinion. At least we're not wearing USB sticks in our ears anymore. And honestly, it does look like an improved version of the old Audio-Tech IM series. Um, obviously, the IM series had some issues with fit, but I think Sony will probably be able to nail this one down. I'm not entirely sure why the carbon fiber faceplate was necessary. It honestly looks a little bit out of place and is probably a little incongruent. Um, I think if they had just done some sort of a thin colored ring and more magnesium in place of the carbon fiber, um, then the earphone would have looked much better. But I think that to a certain extent, it's to maintain parity with the Z1R design, which 
uh, I'm about to move to right now. This is the Z1R. <clears throat> now, if you thought Sony IEMs were different, I think this one is going to be definitely out there. Uh, starting with the appearance, because we were on that topic, the Z1R does look exactly like the final Audio Lab 1 had a love child with the old like CKR9 from Audio Technica and also possibly Audio Tech, um, Audio Tech's IM series. It just, it just looks like a mash of everything together. Also, let's not forget about this looking also a bit like the Kumitate um, trio, I think. Uh, I'll be the first to say the Z1R uh, simply isn't my kind of look. I'm kind of confused as to why this IEM has taken such a steep departure from the utilitarian and very elegant look of the headphone Z1R. Personally to me, it's very flashy, it looks like it's gonna be a scratch magnet and I'm, I have to say, it just looks very odd. I do understand that some people like more of this uh, flashy boutique finish, but you know, it's not, it's not for me. Now, the outer housing is made out of some zirconium alloy and features, as mentioned, the prolage finished faceplate. Uh, this is a way of finishing the metal to make give it that kind of a... I, I don't really know how to describe it, but I think it's been used in some watch designs. Um, the nice thing is that Sony has more or less moved away from, once again, that USB stick in your design and is now featuring a more streamlined design due to the fact that the drivers are positioned coaxially uh, with the sound, natural sound path. I mean. This is kind of nice. I, I was never really able to get the Z5 fit to work properly. I think part of the reason why um, those of you on my Discord will know I dislike the EX1000 is, the, is probably because the EX1000 doesn't seem to fit right. Granted, I did try it out at e earphone and I was, uh, I gave it an hour, you know, but you know, that's still not enough to really figure out the best uh, fitting or the best tips. But I'm saying that there's a good chance that that USB stick design uh, didn't work out. So, moving to the more conventional design, that's really nice. Uh, the, the topic of drivers, there's a 5mm LCP dynamic tweeter, and a balanced armature, and also the pretty large 12mm miniaturized version of the headphone Z1R driver. So one, you'll be seeing that LCD surround uh, meet up with that magnesium dome, uh, but in a earphone. Now, I'm not really certain that the surround's necessary, but you know, uh, I guess it is kind of cool to be able to get a mini Z1R, like physically a mini Z1R, not just signature wise. And uh, all of three of these drivers will exist in an inner housing made of a magnesium alloy. Once again, this is a theme that's been repeated in the M7 and M9. And Sony is apparently venting this housing in a kind of a special way. Um, for those of you who've seen the um, uh, the campfire, the inside of the campfire audio, um, it does have that similar idea of the uh, acoustic expansion chamber, uh, which is a really nice way of saying, you know, the balanced armature drivers are open, the sound's gonna mix in this uh, housing, it's gonna exit. Um, Sony has decided that, you know, obviously they need to vent this, and the way they're going to do this is by leaving an extended acoustic cavity behind the large 12 millimeter driver, if I'm not wrong, and connecting that to some sort of a vent using acoustic tubing. Obviously, crossover points are not clear. Uh, I think I was not able to really figure out what was going on in the technical interview. It was not entirely clear what uh, was going on. And I think in general, uh, we can expect, because there's some sort of circuitry, that there are you know, passive crossovers. It's gonna be like the Andro, the sound's gonna mix in the housing before exiting the earphone. And I think for the most part, that more or less covers everything that I currently know uh, and Joseph currently knows about the earphones. Uh, we can expect to see all of this uh, released sometime in uh, September, at least for the Southeast Asia region. And um, the pricing is going to be, uh, it, I think for the most part it's been finalized, but the pricing is going to be pretty steep. Now, sorry for the delay here. I'm going to take a moment to pull up the pricing information. So. In the meantime, you can take a look at some of the very elaborate packaging that Sony has decided to include. Uh, I think the earphones are going to come with uh, uh, two cables, the um, balanced cable and uh, obviously the unbalanced cable. Once again, very nice Sony carrying case. Uh, the Z1R uh, package, which I'm gonna show here, is absolutely over the top and kind of reminds me of the whole headphone Z1R packaging. It's the whole uh, and leather and case, you know, it's, it's over the top and it's absolutely what you would expect from an expensive earphone. 
Uh, segwaying back to my ability to finally pull up the pricing information, the Z1R is going to retail at 2.5k SGD. Um, the M9 is going to go for 1.6k SGD, and the M7 is going to go at a, a more reasonable 900 SGD. Uh, it's interesting to see that there's a pretty huge disparity between the M7 and M9, considering that only a single balancer armature was added, but alas, as with most things Portify, you are paying for the signature and the tuning. So, uh, with that, I think that more or less concludes our first look of these three new earphones. I hope you enjoyed it, and once again, this has been That One New, signing out.